Hello. Hello. This is where we pretend that we've not just been talking to each other for the past 15 minutes. Exactly. <laughs> but maybe so, what I should say is I should say thank you to All Academy for like lending us people and like some stream yard and doing weird things to my panda. So I now have an Academy mask on my panda. I know. I kind of like it though. It's kind of cute. <laughs> I did actually once try them with like a gold eye thing, but I thought it looked too much like a superhero mask. <laughs> That's like, it's not a good thing, really. It's not, it's not a good association. Yeah. So I suppose we better say here we are, aren't we? I suppose. Do you yeah. want to go first? <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, we are Nick, King of Pandas, and Tanya, and <laughs> Tanya Adkin. And we thought, because it's Children's Mental Health Week, hop on and do a little bit of a live session and talk about children's mental health, with it being the week and all. So yeah, my name's Tanya Adkin. Um, if you're watching from the group or Academy, you probably know that already. Um, what do I do? What do I do, like, Nick? What do I do? Everything. Get yourself about. <laughs> yeah, get myself about a lot. So yeah, um, in the NT world, I suppose I'm known as a complex autism specialist. So we we'll work primarily in education and social care um, with young people and adults who have got complex autistic presentations and different intersections of mental health needs, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and Nick, what do you do, Nick? Nick, I'm the panda lady. I go around being the panda lady. No, I, um, I deliver autism training internationally. We have NeuroBears, which is the only course for autistic young people and children. Um, that's just hopefully about to go through ethics for research. Touch some wood. Fresh news this week is that I'm joining the Anna Freud AT Autism National Training Programme. So there you go. There's fresh news hot off the press. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And we sit on various task forces Everything. and mdts and basically charities, we're just and, charities. Yeah. and the list is endless <laughs> yeah adhd is is the gift that keeps on giving it's really so, important yeah. that we're not bored just for the survival of like the next well. generation of autistic young people yeah exactly awesome. yeah so we have our fingers in a lot of um a lot of autistic pies especially in kind of the 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 idea of like kind of mental health and so we thought we'd do a specifically um oh chloe's just commented actually she's one of the new autism and anna freud trainers so yeah there we go so hopefully that will be good. oh somebody else to say morning from melbourne australia good morning good morning yes oh, God, it's really early over there isn't it like really early yeah so it's yeah if not early oh. Children's Mental Health Week, Nick. Well, the theme this year was connections. And I've shared some stuff on my page this week. But when I sort of I read connections and a lot of people have gone with children connecting with other people. Um, but what I went with was much more about children connecting with themselves because you can't really connect with other people if you've lost that sort of that connection or that self-understanding yeah. so I started with um I think connecting with your stimming because I think unless you're mm. Mm. in that place where you can sort of be balanced and be calm and be measured and if you don't feel that you can sort of you can be yourself and you can stim it's really hard to have a safe connection with somebody else if you haven't done that that step in that sort of hierarchy of needs um so I was sort of encouraging open stimming I went down North Yorkshire a few weeks back and I was talking about stimming with a couple of hundred teachers and I was like where are the stim toys in this room like what are you like stimming with and like a couple of them might have been tapping their pen or something and one of them volunteered that they had blue tack in their pocket and I was like but but we can just we just him. You can do it openly. And like if I, I sort of I mentioned that somebody had like been tapping their leg, like they stopped immediately. And you could see that like there was a shame element to it. I don't really want to shame anyone, but like 
you could just sort of see that they like they didn't feel that freedom and that sort of connection with their bodies that they could just do what they want with it. Yeah, yeah, that is really important because a lot of our regulation is directly linked. You know, I mean, I think it's like me and Kieran often have conversations about this that, like, technically, if you think about it, emotion and being able to emotionally regulate it—that's a sense. That's in line with all your other senses. When you think of it in terms of monotropism, you can't be emotionally regulated or connected or any of those things if you're not regulated in your senses in the other way. Exactly. You know? So, yeah, that that's really, really important. And I think connection, you touched on, like, self-identity as well. Mm. And that that's kind of really important to mental health because, for me there is direct correlation between poor mental health being autistic and the kind of pathology paradigm Mm -hmm. and the kind of negative kind of connotations that surrounds the word. Um, And that's why it kind of came up with pandas, isn't it? So we could go, no, look, it's just this thing. It's not positive. It's not negative. It's just. I mean, there is research starting to come through now and obviously it's adults that shows that if you understood that you were autistic at a younger age, that potentially you will have more positive mental health outcomes as an adult. And that is how we try and frame neurobias. We frame it around the five A's. And as part of this research study with these two students that have had volunteered as tribute for me, bless them. Um, they were like, they were trying to frame these questionnaires around the five A's. And I was like, what you don't understand is that the kids can't, achieve that agency and that advocacy until they're adults what we want them to be is to be prepared as children and have those coping skills and for these sort of these ideas to be innate before they get to adulthood so they don't get to 18 and suddenly like drop into burnout or their late teens so i i see that a lot i see that a lot with um autistic kids that are teens usually coming up to 14 15 16 all of a sudden they've realized that they want autonomy and agency but because they've been conditioned under that kind of stereotype that they need visual timetables and everything deciding for them and all the rest of it actually what happens is they get to the point where you know social care or school goes right that's it transition to adulthood now make your own decisions talk to me about what you would do and and actually that that becomes overwhelming because they've never been in positions where they can have that agency and that autonomy yeah. so a lot of the stuff like you know a lot of assessments that i do end up being that teaching how we teach autonomy because you can't just rip the plaster off when they've had no freedom because it creates a mental health poor outcome yeah but that's it and it's just and it's bonkers, isn't it, that we've kind of got into that kind of place where, you know, autistic kids and and people are so observed and so judged and so microscoped mm. that all their movements are kind of so, yeah, you know, yeah, rigidly controlled that they only start panicking about it when it when they're coming up to sixteen and the Mental Capacity Act applies. Because they go, oh, poo, what we've been doing might represent a deprivation of somebody's liberty. Now we need to give them all the choices. Yeah. And then and they sit in best interest. Yeah. And they sit in best interest meetings going, well, why can't this young person give us their wishes and feelings? Yes, exactly. Because they've never been allowed to have wishes and feelings unless it's fit with somebody else's agenda, which is going goes into the masculine narrative. As well, I think, again, when I was back, because it was, it was a couple of hundred teachers and you do the thing where you go, who knows what alexithemia is? And I had in 222 people. And then who's done the emotional regulation work on some sort of sliding scale of one to five, half the room. Yeah. And, but they're not giving the kids the tools to sort of look at their interception system to like process these emotions and we're also constantly telling them that they're fine and they're not fine so then they're processing 
emotions and feelings and even just pain is, oh, this must be fine because this adult that I trust and is safe tells me it's fine. Yeah. And so especially fine. In the mainstream as well, because actually yeah. when they're different and they're surrounded by neurotypical children and everybody's going, you're fine, you're fine, you're fine. And all the neurotypical children are fine and getting on with it. They don't know that their internal experience is very different. They just think that they suck at humaning. Which just feeds that awful masking narrative and leads into burnout as well. And the other thing as well that I find as well is everybody thinks that if you throw a social story or a visual timetable or a sensory diet, or something else from the autism shelf. Yeah, yeah. yeah. At a masking autistic young person, that they're just going to pick it up and run with it. They're not. It's got to be ingrained and integrated mm-hmm. and modeled by the adults, you know? Absolutely. I think think people are sort of and then again like if if you end up because my children are obviously very very well aware and well read and obviously my eldest is in you of theirs and created a monster Nick he created a monster I've created my retirement plan is what I've created (laughs) (laughs) but um but like when they were young and in a mainstream school they were told that they knew too much about autism Genuinely, oh, yeah. that they knew too much, but yeah. actually what they had was some odd, but only coping strategies that they had available to them, and they were using them. And then, yeah, and then they were told they knew too much about their own identity, and you just can't think of another culture or minority group where you would turn around and say that to somebody. You know too much about your Christianity. You know too much about your cultural background. You know too much about your religion. Yeah, that's then, like around to a neurotypical and saying you know too much about Love Island, isn't it? <laughs> because that's their culture. No, I'm joking. I am joking. But do you know, the thing is, it's like, and that's the thing as well. I think that's not made it into to kind of mainstream where you know being autistic is very much a cultural experience. We have shared experience, you know, um, and we, you know there are words and languages and things that we we use that it's definitely a cultural identifier i mean spoons is something energy accounting that's been adopted yes. you know that's frequent language in in my my house or mm-hmm. you know every time one of us forgets something or loses something it's like adhd so all these things are kind of normal but when you don't grow up in an environment where that conversation is kind of normalized all that you left with thinking is the problem must be you yes and I think it's definitely a privilege that I had that oh and we had as a family that I recognize in that I grew up in a generational household where I don't think they associated the word autism with themselves because I mean my granddad would be a hundred and odd now and I mean you know Asperger and Kanna were just hanging around at the same time as him um but he very much lived his life in a way that completely suited him and completely worked for him and you know you can very clearly see he was autistic and that sort of that carried on throughout like were family line and as well I think like I think quite often now because at least well I wasn't diagnosed but my husband was diagnosed before we had children and I think the fact that the conversations around autism and stuff were just part of life. And it was, we already talked about spoons. We already talked about energy accounting. We already talked about burnout. We already talked about coping strategies that, you know, that you could use to compensate for a hard day. And I think that was sort of, I think that it, it just, it's a so gift they, to be able yeah. to give people, you know. They basically had the privilege in growing up in an environment that taught them how to autism. Yes. Yeah. And that's yeah. it. That's what it is. And it taught them the culture. And, and and a lot of people don't have that, do they? Even if they are autistic or even that they might not even know. Because mm-hmm. I always find it funny when um, you're speaking with parents. And I had one today, actually. And, you know kid's not doing very well in school and they need a plan and blah 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 and I think his dad might be autistic and we're like "Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah sure 
you know it's 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 that kind of like negative women oh no never you know never but it's that kind of like negative kind of association or that it's something that only children can be or you know in the research it's like it can only be young white males because that's what the research was based on and i think we're learning so much now more now that actually i'm kind of scared if we carry on we're not going to be a minority anymore <laughs> you know yeah because i think what we're talking about now the, the lowest end of research says one in 35 but that doesn't include other neurodivergence it isn't and including wasn't it like isn't it like 15% of the population is neurodivergent in some way? In theory, yeah. And quite a lot of that is attributed to ADHD. Yeah. yeah. And if you look at things like neuroqueer theory, um, you know, Nick Walker actually poses that neurotypicality doesn't actually exist. It's just a performative role. You know? that some people can perform neurotypically. And if you think about the way that the diagnostics and stuff work mm -hmm. and, and the theories that we know, it's kind of true, isn't it? If you can perform neurotypically, you're neurotypical. Welcome to the club. If you can't, you're diverging from that. Yeah. When we look at it in that sense. So actually, they're probably, you know, we probably, yeah. It, is there really anything, is there really anybody out there that's not struggling in some way that could be attributed to some kind of neuroqueer oh, and divergence? This is the thing. I mean, if you start listing all the things that is in, like, the DSM or the ICD-11, and, you know, that's everything from autism to sort of, like, feeding difficulties in infants or you know depression or anxiety or you know the list is essentially endless and at what point can somebody you know not associate with that even if it's just in a point in your life rather than you know a lifelong thing yeah there is there is no real sort of neurotypical chloe's just pointed out that minorities don't have to be statistically so but they are in kind of relation to power imbalances yeah, we can, we're working on that, Chloe. We're working on it. <laughs> maybe by the next generation. Yeah, maybe yeah. by the next generation or the generation after. But yeah. So yeah, mental health, it's a big one as well, isn't it? I think Emma Dallamain at the minute has got a big um, petition going around about, yeah. you know, lots of CAMs not recognising or supporting autistic young people with mental health difficulties. Because apparently, if you're autistic, you have mental it's, health difficulties. It's the autisms. I mean, I can't remember reading that in the DSM-5. Can you? That's because it's not in there. Oh, damn. Somebody should let them know. <laughs> I, 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 <laughs> oh, that's sarcasm, by the way. Sorry. I mean, I, mean, I tried. Um, but I mean, when... So I sat with the, um, the Autism Pathways study, which I think might be public. Maybe the short version is definitely public. Mm -hmm. um, but that showed that only 23% of SIPs or CAMs are following nice guidelines. It's um, not surprising. And then within that, you've got all sorts of recruitment and staff retention and funding difficulties. And they're just looking for anything to try and lower their workload and I, I don't mean that in a sort of a bad way in a judgy professionals kind of way but it's it they're sort of they're, they're out of options now you know and I think even something that's really telling is recently I've seen on um like particularly with local groups that people are now shocked that there's a six month wait for a private diagnosis and they like they genuinely believed that they would be able to go private and get it now but actually anyone decent operating privately is running at least six months, if not more. Yeah, yeah. And then you've actually that sort of privilege again where, you know, it's only if you can afford it. And then... But then even if you can afford it, you then at the point where local authorities won't accept it because you've paid for the diagnosis, which is completely illegal. It, it's a really... It's a really difficult time. And with all services, really, I can't see it getting any better. No. 
with like everything is just running on such a skeleton that even if you did get the CAMS referral and they did see you within the 18 weeks or whatever it is. Yeah, it's what, 18 weeks, but still. Yeah. But what help what help is there for them to give? Well, this is this is the other side of it, isn't it? That what is appropriate mental health support look like for young autistic people? Mm. Do you know what I mean? I, you know, we talk about CBT and how that's not necessarily appropriate. And then there's ETMR, which is, and then there's talking therapy or sort of like, I've seen a lot of sort of group emotional work, which is fine if you've got an interception system going between you. Um, You know, and I sort of, I think I often see people who are like very focused on, somebody needs to come and help but then actually when when they get to that point of the queue it's not necessarily the right help it's not in a timely manner it's there is, yeah not necessarily appropriate it could actually be potentially more damaged than than not and i think again that's that's quite a lot back to sort of neuro bears in the i think sometimes fundamentally the only person that you can help is yourself and sometimes it's about that that personal knowledge and that personal well-being and that that sort of idea that you can understand yourself and then you can start creating boundaries. And then I'm not saying that we can all go through life without help from a third party, mm. but I definitely think you need to be in a place where you can identify if that third party's help is actually helping you. Yeah, so it's like it's almost like a hierarchy of needs, and we need to start at the bottom, which is yeah. the golden equation, which is autism plus environment equals outcome. But yeah. what you know, it's not just it's not even just about the physical environment, it's about the attitudes that you're surrounded by, the attitudes that you're picking up about yourself, mm -hmm. what you're understanding about yourself and your own needs. It's about having the confidence, being in environments where you don't have to mask so much, mm -hmm. even though that's not optional all the time. Um, so that you can advocate for your own needs. And if you don't understand what your own needs are, if exactly. the specialist school doesn't understand the need to stim, yeah. how how were they supposed to teach autistic children yeah. to stim and regulate that? Absolutely. You know? um, I mean, the, and it's often therapies and medications, and I'm not saying there aren't places for therapies and medications. There clearly yeah. are. But oftentimes when we get into situations and we're assessing situations, you know, we're looking at timetables that are so full and in really large colleges. And, you know, a young person might be experiencing several meltdowns and shutdowns and they're going, well, he needs psychological input and he needs medication. And you just think, sorry, what? <laughs> Well, this is the other side of it as well. I was sitting in sort of a, a meeting a few months back with NHS England where they were talking about finding a phrase that talked about that waiting period before, like, you're seen. And they were, like, throwing things around, like, sort of well waiting and waiting well. And I was just getting so frustrated because I think, I think there's genuinely this sort of idea that you sort of, you have a referral into a system and then you just sort of, sit there you know like a granny holding a handbag at a bus stop you know that kind of image that your life's just sort of at the post office waiting waiting yeah. for this to happen whereas realistically if that is happening you're already in crisis and crises don't wait no no and you're only ever one bad professional away from a crisis aren't you Nick? You are only ever one poor professional away from a crisis, which is my favourite phrase, and I use it in pretty much every time I run training because it just applies to everyone and everything, um, yeah. that it only takes one person to sort of collapse your house of cards. Yeah. And, it can and that's it. Rebuild. I mean, you know, I would say 99% of the young people and adults, actually, that I see... Hmm a lot of their mental health symptoms would be drastically improved by adaptations to the environment. Yes. It's not that complex a lot of time. And there are other co-occurring things. 
mm -hmm. um, that can be an awful lot more complex. But actually, you've got to start there, haven't you? And and this is the thing. So you get through to CAMS, and CAMS aren't going to turn around and say, you know, we, oh, yeah, th this, this young person's got sensory trauma, you need to take them out of school, because it doesn't put the other one's bread. Well, it's not even within their remit, is it? That they're, yeah. they're, they're very, very hesitant to get involved in education. Mm. And even if you get a good one that'll stick their neck out for you, you know, it's it's difficult it's, for them. It's poo pooed because they're not educationalists. Yeah, exactly. Even though they're talking about a sensory environment that has a direct and detrimental impact on, on a young person's mental health. And I think um, it was only 9% of SIPs or CAMs that are running with an OT. Yeah, there just are no a OTs, are they? Well, I mean, I, I don't really blame them all for going private because I wouldn't work for the NHS as it stands either. But, like, no. No. Absolutely not. And um, even, the, even the independent ones are completely overrun. Yeah. But, you know, the ones that we recommend are. Because I don't think anybody wants to stay within the NHS now. So it's really difficult... And that's a really difficult conversation to, to have with a lot of parents as well, that, you know, they expect to get the diagnosis or after they wait, they will wait. Yes, you will wait. Yeah. You know, yep. there's going to be light at the end of the tunnel and everything's going to be fine, but it's not. No. Because actually what you get at the end of that tunnel is quite often really outdated theory. There's no training in any of the NHS. There's no training budgets. Um, well, not we're more. coming for them. We're coming. We're coming. We're coming. But you know that there's so it's really outdated theory. It's you know there's not a lot of sensory OTs out there, or not a lot of places have. I know that a lot of specialist schools don't even have access to sensory OTs. Um, you know they're dragging in as many OTs as they can and sending them on two, three day sensory training in tra courses it's not enough because it's just such a crisis in mm. in any kind of care and we're not just talking about carers either it's kind of nurses doctors ot's clinicians mm -hmm. speech and language therapists they're all incredibly burnt out and i think going back to what you're saying about sort of how people feel like diagnosis is and, and don't get me wrong i think diagnosis is very important and i always encourage people to go get one but no matter yeah. what age they are. Um, but I think some of the most crushing conversations I've had is what do you expect after they're diagnosed? And it's, I expect A, B, C, and D to happen. And I often say, if A, C, you know, if, if that list of things was going to happen, it could happen now without a diagnosis. Yes, you will have one. Yes, you will be able to fight with a letter in your back pocket. But doesn't mean anything it, it's not actually if people aren't already on board with like meeting need it's probably not going to make a fundamental difference to them getting on board yeah i get that's a question i get asked a lot so when parents approach me they're going oh should we pay for a private diagnosis should we do this and i'm like just get the ehcp sorted first you know yeah. because actually if we look at it from a legal perspective, what we're doing is we should be identifying, assessing, identifying and meeting needs where they're at. Yeah. Um, and that's the really kind of heartbreaking thing because parents and, and people are set up to think if they do the waiting and they, you know, they tick the boxes and they hang on until they get front, in front of the doctor or the clinician or the paediatrician, they'll get that piece of paper and the heavens will open. It won't. No. And often now, because they're trying to do the quickest possible assessment. So the um, the advice is that an assessment should be sort of somewhere between 18 and 13 hours long. <laughs> Who, who's getting that these days? Um, and that's that sort of that's the guidance. That's that's what it should be. And it should involve a multidisciplinary team. It should have maybe a SALT. It should have an OT. It should have a clinical site. It should have a specialist nurse. And that is how it's meant to be. But it's not what you're getting. And then what you end up with is, a, you know, a letter that says it's the autisms. Um, yeah. And then what do you do with that? Well, you 
do, do you, you possibly take it to school and go, I've got a letter that says it's the autisms and the school turn around and go, all right, now and that's what? the thing. Yeah, because you think, great, yeah, I'll have this meeting with this Senko and they're a Senko, so they'll know what's going on. No. 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 I mean, some do. If some they do. happen to have an interest that they've gone off and sorted them out themselves, but definitely not from they have been trained by a third party body perspective. They've no. been trained to fill in some forms. Yeah, yeah. And that's that's basically all the additional Senko training is, isn't it? It's kind of like budget watching. So they're only, and it's not even their fault because, no. you know, they're teachers. They're literally, their hours are ringed out like there's no tomorrow. But yeah, it, it is... It is quite, it's quite a sorry state of affairs. So that's kind of why it's kind of better to learn as a family. Exactly. And that's, that's why it was, it was always in my head when I first, when I first sort of went with, I can teach autistic kids about autism with bears. And Kieran looked at me like I'd grown three heads and I was going crazy. And I was like, I had this horrific drawing that you'll possibly share one day of this like bear that had red eyes <laughs> and I was like we can we can do their sensory systems and we can like they can leave and this was the, the initial concept that they could leave with their own interpretation of their own sensory systems and that's where that first sort of bit grew from mm -hmm. and that's what I wanted I just wanted them to be in a place where they could understand themselves in this moment outside of an observational model and just have the right words and the right language to to go somewhere else, to go to a professional and say, this is what is happening for me. Not what you assume is happening for me. Mm, not what you tell me is happening for me, but no, 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 this is what's happening for me. Yeah. And that's so important, so important, because, you know, I think that some of the most important work that I do is literally teaching autistic young people about themselves. And well, it's removing that stigma. We're not even telling them. Can you think of like, maybe not really, really young, but like what other place where we, are we not telling young people about what diagnosis that we're giving them? Like, how is it a thing? How is it a thing that they're going through like these sort of, these meetings and these appointments and we're not telling them. <laughs> yeah. And then and that feeds back is. into the autonomy and agency and the yeah. lack of and the masking, doesn't it? Like, I have genuinely no idea what these kids think are happening at these appointments when we're talking with a professional in a very deficit based way because that's kind of that's the model and that's what you've got to do and that's sort of how it is in that room. They are hearing that. They absolutely are. And then we wonder where why are they associated with... negatively. Yeah, and not just that, but why there are poor mental health outcomes mm. for autistic people. Oh, this is the other thing as well. I think quite often we need to think about when we're talking about autism with these young people. I think quite often it's after they've had a bad day after they've had a meltdown, after they've had a really poor interaction with a peer. And then they start to think about all these sort of negative things that happen and start associating the word autism with all these negative things that have happened. And then it becomes a negative thing. And then it becomes maybe an identity that you reject, which results in masking, which results in burnout, which results in poor mental health. And it yeah. can be an absolutely horrific cycle if it's just not framed within within culture within how your life is just how it is it doesn't have to be desperately positive it definitely doesn't have to be negative it can just be this is it this is what it is this is monotropism yeah this is the thing this will explain a few things about you exactly these are your different senses sometimes yeah. they're going to go up and sometimes they're going to go down and sometimes they're going to be both but it's okay it's not abnormal <laughs> you know this is double empathy. This is why you get on better with some people than others. And that's okay. Yeah. You know? 
But yeah. Absolutely. I think, I mean, there's there's this phrase by Einstein that if you if you understand it, you can explain it to a six-year-old. And that is sort of like my gift in a way, because I understand that people don't understand it and they can't explain it to a six-year-old and that's fine, but that doesn't mean they don't need to know. Yeah. And is. like, we can, you know, you can, you can now get a tool to help you do that. And, and that's then, it. It's the fundamentals, isn't it? It's the fundamentals. So when we're looking at men, children's mental health week and, you know, everybody's thinking about it's how do we maintain that actually before we get into a crisis how do we maintain good mental health because that's what it is it's about maintenance yeah you know you don't eat mars bars every day and then go to the hospital when you're almost having a heart attack and then go back to eat mars bars every day you maintain a balanced healthy kind of mars bar addiction yeah, you make you you know, you just gotta keep the keep the maintenance of the mental health and, and you know it's kind of a, it's environmental, it's making sure that the sensory environment isn't toxic and traumatizing. It's making sure that children know that they can say no. Exactly. I mean, I can remember having it <laughs> with my son. Um and I can remember being called into school and they they said to me what was it oh he's he's climbed up a tree he won't come down and he keeps telling us to f off so i was like well what why did why did that happen and they were like we told him it was time to come inside from outside and he didn't want to come in okay so what did you then do so we tried to catch him so we went up a tree yeah. and told us yeah. then, so, and that's the communication thing, isn't it? You're not listening to the communication. So what happens is when you don't listen to the agency and the communication, that behavior then gets um, that behavior then gets labeled as challenging. But actually, it's the adults yes. opposing the challenge to the children. Yes, I can remember um, very clearly dropping the child off not at the current school. Um, and so a, a child started to bold. Now you couldn't physically get out of this school. Like there was no open gate. Like he wasn't getting out. Mm. And like she screamed and ran after him. And then he went faster because flight. Mm. And I was sort of thinking, you know, like you could just walk and not be a threat and therefore not have the outcome that you're then going to place within the realms of behaviour that needs fixing without ever it's looking in the mirror. And that's what I mean about the observation of autistic kids. Yeah. You know, and where it just needs to go back to baseline, like what is happening in that environment? Yeah. You know, because... And that's why, you know, it's why we use polar bear because observationally he's white, but polar yeah. bear's a black. And I, I love that. That's That was my... My yeah. favourite fact. My first time people on the project, trust professionals. So preliminary data from the post doc I'm on. This is Chloe. Adverse childhood experiences and their relationships to mental health and the young people on the project don't trust professionals yeah. or e.g. CBT. They want lived experience professionals. It and was one of my like favorite feedbacks from NeuroBears. We had um, like the the trial group that we did a like a draft run with, I suppose. And my favorite feedback was, "I am so glad you're autistic. I get so sick of talking about the autisms from the neurotypicals." Like I love that. I could hear her. I could hear her saying it. But this yeah. is the thing. And um, my eldest is currently doing research about like education environments that aren't brick buildings. Mm. and they were sort of they were given a bit of free reign about how they communicated and what they like they wanted to show about like the, what they liked about their education environment and what really took me is I thought they would come back with lots of environmental pictures like sort of outdoor spaces or like circus spaces and stuff like that the majority of the photos showed that they really like their ND mentors so my eldest currently has only neurodivergent mentors and teachers not deliberately it's just kind of the spaces that we've gone in are nd friendly and therefore have attracted nd staff 
Um, and I just thought that sort of, and and they trust them implicitly and I trust them implicitly. Like we don't need to have conversations about all sorts of stuff just because everybody's ND and everybody just gets it. It's that, that mutual and that cultural understanding that it's just... And like, that's really powerful just for, you know, even if you're not teaching a young person about being autistic and what that means in a non-pathologizing way. Mm -hmm. It's sometimes just really powerful for them to be able to sit with you and go, oh yeah, yeah, I, I, I'm autistic too. That's it. Yeah. And I think, I think one of the beautiful things about Gecko is they only use ND tutors and there cannot be that honest conversation because they have burned out from school as well. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? None of them are there because they were fine in school. They weren't. And it's mm -hmm. actually, even though they're adults and, you know, that other people are children, they've had the same experience. Mm. Yeah, and it's just, it becomes generational trauma, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So I want to tell my son that he's autistic, but I've been advised by his clinical psychologist to wait until he's better, as at the moment he's suffering from burnout and school trauma. They've said if we tell him now, he would associate it with something bad. Do you think it's better to tell him now or wait? Well, this is the thing about the idea of better. You know, once that kind of burnout's tipped in. It's always happened. Is Yeah, that's it now. He's broken the seal. Um, I mean, that is entirely up to you. That is entirely up to you. But what is your son's six-year-old, what is your six-year-old's understanding of what is happening to him right now and why? And if he doesn't understand what's happening to him and why, how scary might that be for him in terms of what do I need to do be to get better? When is it going to get better? Is this normal? Will this happen again? Because actually, if you've got the idea that he's going to have a burnout, recover, and then go straight back into the environment that caused the burnout in the first place, you're constantly going to be in that cycle. So any environment that he does go back into when he's ready is going to have to be extremely modified depending on what created burnout in the first place. Especially at six. It's very young. It's very young for a burnout. Very young. So I would hope that you've got a really good sensory OT on board because mm. that's going to be really important mm. in recovery and in any future kind of provision. Um. I mean, I, as an autistic person, the only thing that I can say is I would want to know what was happening to me and why. And it's, I think it, it a lot of it is about how you frame it. Mm -hmm. If you frame it as a positive and go, look, oh, wow, we figured out what's happening. It's because you're autistic. And that means that busy environments make your brain quite poorly sometimes. Yeah. But now we know that. We won't do busy environments. Yeah, it exactly. It could be as simple as that. And it, it really can be. It genuinely does not. I mean, my kids, you know, we don't do the whole war and peace, sit down, we need to have a talk thing because that just creates anxiety. You know, it's usually in the car, actually. That's the really good time to have talks. No, I can't act in the car. It's You're amazing trapped. how anyone learns to drive. You're trapped. Um, you know, but it doesn't have, to, if you don't make it a big thing, if it's a big thing for you, mm. a traumatized autistic child will know it's a big thing because they would be watching every kind of little micro expression that you've got. Yeah. You know. My face doesn't do the proper things. Yeah. I mean, that that's my advice on that. But whether you want to or not is entirely up to you. And you can also talk about things that are difficult without using the word autism yeah i always think about, that. we can talk about busy environments we can talk about sensory doors we can talk about peers we can talk about school not being suitable you don't have to use the word autism at any point particularly you know if you worried about that association yeah you don't you know and you can bring in like energy accounting literally into your home you can bring in you know spoons yeah, you can bring in stimming, you can bring in, you know, 
there's so much about autistic culture that helps us that you can bring into that you know we I mean teachers always say that don't they if everybody had an autism friendly classroom it'd massively help out all the kids well you know if we all had autism friendly homes yes it would really help everybody out really and you can encourage that autonomy and thinking about you know what our body's doing and what are our sensory needs and what do we struggle with because Neurotypical stim, neurotypicals have different sensory things. Possibly. I don't think they think about it. I think that's part of the thing. I'm not sure they think about it. I don't know. I think that's maybe the difference. Yeah. But I think if you, at such a young age, at six, I think Mm. you would be surprised how accepting such young ones are. The issues with the rejection don't tend to happen, in my experience, until you're hitting kind of puberty years, yeah. because that's when the drive to fit in yeah. is, and the the kind of realization that you aren't like everybody else really hits home. Mm-hmm. It's when hormones start coming in, and neurotypical kids start getting interested in boys and gossip and falling out and bands and all that social stuff. Yeah, it just creates like a massive chasm between, it it tends to happen then, doesn't it? So I think at six, actually, generally kids are really accepting at six. And I think that that stigma and that, oh, it's something to be afraid of, is something Mm -hmm. that kind of comes from adults, even if they're not explicitly saying that. You know absolutely and I, I do yeah i completely agree and i think that's why obviously having self-understanding before you're a teenager has the privilege of having an early identification through an early diagnosis well i say early but i mean you know before 10. Mm. um and which is why i sort of always said neurobears is for that little bit older but the, it's a, teenagers are a very very different thing because they, they do just they just want to reject and not just that but they've had you know if we're not being identified until we're in our teens or even even if we're older you know there's so many layers of internalized ableism to undo actually learning at six it's 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 a massive privilege in a way absolutely okay. and like you said there's no not a bit of research um, you know, you were talking about the research. The research that is about is saying that the earlier you know, you understand mm-hmm. what those needs are, the better your outcomes are. Absolutely. And there's a reason for that because you're not sat there. And it's like, it's, I suppose it's like the labeling argument, isn't it? You mm-hmm. know, when some people go, oh, well, you know, we don't like to give our kids the label of autistic or ADHD, but you would rather them label themselves as broken or useless or society as weird or feral or unteachable or all of the other things. Oh, Mary's here. Shall we let her in? Oh, maybe. Yeah, let's, uh, yeah. yeah. Let her in. Where is she? Hi. Hello. 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 I'm just going to turn my other light off because I'm looking like I've got a halo over I've my got head. got a halo. Yeah. It's um, oh, one of my... Um, my uncle's friends were down at Christmas and he's in his 60s, maybe, might be in his 70s. Um, and he he now knows that he's dyslexic. Um, but at school, he had the choice of being thick or lazy. And that was the two like options available to him. And he was like, I knew I wasn't lazy. So I assumed I was stupid. And he's not. He's, you know far far from it he's a really sort of you know intelligent guy that's got some very specialized knowledge but yeah. that's you know that's what we need to move away from people who just think that they're, they're, there's something wrong yeah. yeah shall we introduce mary i know oh, please don't <laughs> I'm, making of, I'm making a cup of tea so i'm going to mute myself Bless her. So Mary's jumped in. Mary is very autistic ADHD, as you can tell. She's there making herself a cup of tea. Um, you've worked with Mary before, haven't you? And I have. A lot. 
So Mary's, uh, Mary Cartledge is an autistic ADHD independent social worker that specialises in neurodivergence, bless her. So yes. For our so sins. She she, sorry? For our sins. Yeah, so all sorts of things. So mental capacity, adults, children, CVE, foster and adoption, child protect, all the things. If I'd, if I'd re reeled off a list, we'd be here all night, wouldn't we, Mary? <laughs> yes, I'm a little bit... It's lovely to see you, Nick. Hi. You look, and you look amazing. Um, oh, yes, I've got my ADHD diagnosis. <gasps> yeah. So, you know, like, what you were just saying, Nick, about whether it was an uncle or a cousin, you know, naughty, lazy, you know, I had all that at school. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, and now I can go, ah, that was what's wrong. That was what was wrong. I always start tried to start off every academic year at senior school. I was like, I'm going to do really well this year. My books are going to be really neat and tidy. You know, day one, they were neat and tidy by day one and a half, you know, halfway through the day, car crash. Yeah. yeah. And that's um, the thing. That's what we were talking about, that contribution to mental health. Because <coughs> somebody... Um, Somebody um, talked about how their six-year-old's in burnout and their psychologist has said it's probably not a good time to tell them they're autistic because they might associate it with negative. And we were kind of saying, well, actually, if you don't tell them it's because they're autistic and this is why, then they're probably just going to be there thinking they're broken. Yes, and we work a lot, don't we, with, with children and young people who have a what's wrong with me what's wrong with me mm -hmm. very much internalizing it that it's their fault yeah that they can't do what they think no, they should yeah. be doing and and that pressure and that impact on self-esteem i've been talking about this today actually i've been in tribunal all day talking about self-esteem and confidence and just the negative impact that has on a child mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Because nobody think... actually says, actually, you can say that you're autistic, but it's always, you know, seen as a negative most of the time and pathologizing because nobody actually says, well, actually, that just means you're a bit monotropic. You might have ADHD, which means you might struggle concentrating. You need to move your body more. You're not much going to like busy places and you'll get on with other people like you. Because in a nutshell, that's what it means, isn't it? Yeah. I'm always There's saying, if you're autistic, criteria. you're wrong. If you're autistic, you're wrong. And you must, and you must start bending a little bit more. Yeah. Talking of bending a little bit more, there's a question in. So we're going to take, um, I'm going to take uh, this one. There we go. Hi, I've just stumbled across this great live stream on Facebook. So I hope that my question is appropriate. How can I help my seven-year-old nephew who gets very old? upset if he doesn't win in games i don't know i've never been able to get over not winning and i'm 37 <laughs> this is the thing no, it's, it's, <laughs> if if he was neurotypical we wouldn't be pathologizing it so like the example i often use is that the royal family is not allowed to play monopoly at christmas because people get upset about monopoly everybody knows this everybody knows people tip monopoly boards when they don't win no matter what the neurotype and we are pathologizing the fact that he's taking losing badly, which I know plenty of neurotypical people are taking losing really badly. Because he's autistic. But it's also that assumption, do you know what it is? is does he want to play the games, actually? Um, or is that something that we're thinking that they should be doing? Because actually, I'm pretty sure if we back chained it and go, yeah, I know you want to play this game, but if you don't win, you get really upset. So do we think that's a good idea? Shall we find something different to do? Yeah. Pose it to them. And do you think it's, for me, it's slightly different when when my son, who's nearly 16, yeah. is playing face-to-face -face games, physical, directly, you know, in that moment with other people. Yeah. The playing his online games and his re responses online. It, it, it responds really differently. 
Yeah, because there's that pressure off, isn't there? Yeah. Because not only are they trying to play the game to the best of their ability, but they're also gauging everybody else in their environment and managing the difference in communication. You know, it's a lot for a monotropic brain to process. So actually, then imagine, then asking them to be um, regulated when they've put all that effort into something and not what won is a little bit ridiculous, really. I mean, what's the payback for winning? Yeah. <laughs> Bragging rights. <laughs> and I don't actually, I think also it's about, you know, playing games. What does, you know, what do I get out? I don't really, yeah, I don't play games. I'm really bad. I'm really bad. I'm better with a jigsaw. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think, well, I mean, a little thing that we do from a six-year-old who doesn't like to lose, as with the rest of the family, none of us like to lose. It's a thing. But they're allowed to, um, mid mid-game, join a team. And they often pick who's about to win, whose team to join. And, like, you know, it, well, it's within my family. You know, if they want to come and join somebody's team, that's fine. No six or seven or eight or nine or even 39-year-olds are good at losing. We just mask it, regardless of neurotype, I think. We went away in October with for my mum's 80th and with my sister, who's undiagnosed autistic, definitely, and ADHD. Um, and... We were playing Scrabble, and I get a little bit bored with Scrabble. It's too wordy. So then we switched to Trinonimos, which is numbers. Oh, now I can do that because it's quick. It's quick. The game's over really quickly. It's but it's really interesting sort of watching the interactions and how everybody responded. Like, my mum's really chilled out. My dad's memory's a bit poor anyway. You know, it's just interesting watching how... Why do we play the game? You know, what is it? I've got to be motivated to play it. Intrinsic motivation. And I can't see any intrinsic motivation as to why I'd be wanting to play a game, to be honest. Yeah, we need to do a jigsaw one night, Tanya. Yeah, yeah. You do your jigsaw, I do my jigsaw. We'll do parallel play. Parallel you play. Let, let's not pathologise autistic play. You know, um, and everything is about the taking turns and... And all that stuff. And yeah, Chloe's just said that, you know, losing games, it really hits our self-esteem because in order to take part in those games and to judge everybody else's interaction and communicate, it takes a whole lot more spoons than it does for a neurotypical per person. So we're putting a lot more effort into it. So when that effort doesn't pay off, it's probably going to be a bit more upsetting than it would be for a neurotypical child because of the spoons pay off. And then because the child doesn't win that will have a knock-on effect on confidence and self-esteem and their perception of themselves. But then you'll get professionals, well, they've got to build resilience up. That old, oh. chestnut, that old chestnut. Just, just don't play the games. <laughs> look, at Nick, look at Nick, she's like, really? Yeah, we have that yeah. a lot. I need some smell and salts for the word resilience. Yeah. Yeah, just yeah. don't play the games or play games that aren't necessarily competitive or do things that you can parallel play. You know, think about... Or know, let them win. Or let them win. <laughs> you know, well, this is... So on the Inside of Autism group, there's a question about double empathy the other day. Can you remember, if we taught non-autistic people about autistic communication skills, would that help? And that's the kind of attitude that you've got to have, isn't it? So why are we not playing autistically instead of playing neurotypically? Because, you know, and, you know, and there's got to be some sort of game that plays to the strength. There's got to be. Oh, you know, be it numbers or be it physical, be it gender, be it, you know, Scrabble. No. Sigh. Play adult games. Play adult games. <laughs> Sigh. Oh, I just saw a question, actually, about Tribunal. Do you want to pop it up, Si? Janine? And I may as well get that out of the oh, way. Really. Yeah, get that out of the way. I've just spent seven and a half hours in one today. Yeah. <laughs> Not me. Have you found it, Si? Janine Holden? No, I don't. Oh, there we go. So I have a question. Anybody know the repercussions of an LA failing to uphold the court order 10 weeks from the date of order? So after the tribunal order is issued, they've got five weeks. The only thing that you can really do from that is judicial review. So you would need to speak to a solicitor. I think SOSSEN do them for like £100. Send a pre-action protocol letter. 
if they don't respond and put it right, then you can go through legal aid and take them to judicial review. It's it, it's a bit like, you know, how we said getting that diagnosis didn't mean that everything was going to be fine and there was no pot of gold at the end of that rainbow. It's the same with coming out of tribunal. The resources just are not yeah. there. And I think what's interesting is if it's an interesting, they haven't followed the recommendations from the, the tribunal order. Um, some barristers are looking out for judicial review cases. So it is always worth just to have a little bit of a gandy out there and see what's out there. Yeah, so speak to places like Coram, Coram and yeah. Simpson, Simpson and Miller as well. But I know that Coram are more kind of open about what sort of cases they're looking to take on. Um, so get on the phone to them because they may have a barrister that's looking to, because judicial review cases are kind of career making for barristers. Um, so you just got to go fishing for a barrister that wants to take in a local authority to do judicial review. And you should be okay. So yeah, there we go. We did the tribunal talk. Because <laughs> we can't, we can't fix this system. We can't fix anything within the system. We can't rely on it to work at all. The only thing that you can control is the stuff within yourself and within your home. Yeah. And get it right there. And then and about themselves. Yeah. That is so valuable, I think, giving young people the language or understanding why society treats them so shittily. You know, I mean, I've had it said to me that, you know, you can't talk to teenagers about testimonial injustice and, you know, feminism and ableism and racism. I'm like, yeah, you can. Yeah, you can. Because they need to understand where all of this shitty package that they're being handed is built mm. from if if my six-year-olds can learn what a split vowel diagraph is they What's can learn about feminism what is i don't know what time is <laughs> <laughs> what is that rachel's it rachel hi rachel rachel, oh, rachel. Ah, Rachel, she's a colleague. Is it our Rachel? Is. She didn't want to come on, though, because she was a bit shy. Well, yeah, she's not going to ask anything complicated and complex. I think, Nikki, Nick, what you just said about mm. system and, and 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 the home and, you know, it just today, just in tribunal, I just, yeah, it wasn't a bad hearing, but it's just re the reality of what parents have to go through to get even the basic care of their yeah. children's needs met. It's really quite horrifying. Have you seen it in the news today about parents setting up an autism school down south? That's no. koala, isn't it? Is it? Yeah, I've just been sent know. the link. Just been sent the link. Um, Hampshire Charity plans a new school run by autistic adults. Pretty sure that's koala, isn't it? Is it? Uh, charity wants to open what it thinks to be the first. Anyway, we're going off a tangent here, aren't we? In Andover, in Am Hampshire. Mm -hmm. But maybe that's what needs to happen. Maybe people do need to take it into their own hands. And I'm not saying. And it's really difficult because, I mean, it's like we get a lot of parents come to us asking, asking about accessing social care. And actually, if you read the law, mm. you know, it's very the law versus the policy. Yeah. Yes. It's that, very it? <laughs> what social care should be providing. And actually, for disabled children, the sky's the limit. Technically. Mm. Technically. But they've developed that many different policies and protocol and loopholes around it that there is only a safeguarding lens for social care now as far as disabled children are concerned. Or apparently. <laughs> Because there are no resources. Resources have been stripped back that much. The defensive practices, not only in CAMS and autism assessments or social care, but it's also in education because it's about guarding resources. And so all I think that links to, you know, how many times do I read mum was emotional? Mum's anxiety. Why aren't we talking about the parents who aren't emotional? Like if you are, if your child is not okay and you do not feel emotionally about that, why aren't those the parents that we're talking about? Because to me, that's that's the one that's not right. They would be. 
if that was the case, that would be a problem. It's just trying to find a problem to not give resources. It's, it's not personal. I tell you what else I find really bizarre: having a child that's like also got a level of physical disability and was in hospital from a very young age with physical conditions. If you cry and like completely break down there, that's fine. And they're really okay with it. And in fact, they encourage it. And I've absolutely had, you know, a baby on a machine and people are like, no, no, your children are your vulnerability. It's okay that you are upset. But the second that it's autism or an invisible condition or ADHD, it's framed entirely differently. Because it's not really real, is it? It's just something that we give, you know, it's just a label that we give to badly parented kids. Because let's be honest, that's what the hangover is. You know, it's been a while since Bethlehem died. If we could right. get over that, that would be awesome. Yeah. I it's think it's that it's that attitude, isn't it? It's attitudes of, well, he doesn't look that disabled, does he? Yeah. You know, it's, it's, I think it's, it goes back to what you two talk about in the Inside of Autism course. It's all that stuff of how people view disability, isn't it? Mm. Because like oh, autism, goodness. mental health, you can't see it, can you? You know, if I walk around with a bandage on my head, will that help you work out that my head's hurting me? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And it's still taboo, isn't it? It's still, when we talk about, you know, we're meant to be really aware of children's mental health. But actually, they've got to build resilience, haven't they? But then it's got to be about, you know, I think no one's quite sure where to position themselves professionally and services, public services, don't know where to position themselves because they're really worried about mental health. But then they've got to build resilience and they've got to be in school because then they're not isolated. It, there's so many contradictions to it, isn't it? But all these contradictions are made so that nobody spends money and resources. That's ultimately what it comes down to, isn't it? Yes. Yes, Rachel. Oh, so Rachel's Rachel. Rachel coming on board now. See, I told you. Should... Parent blame is pandemic in itself. Lots of work going. Yes, there is a lot. I've got to publish but my paper on this. It's not a global pandemic. It is a very much an England kind of situation. You know, I once talked to a psych in Ireland and he was like, what do you mean, you know, five people within 10 miles of you that have had parent blame? And I was like, that's, that's it's just a fact. And he was like, but what do you mean? <laughs> and I'm like, well, it's just how it is here. And he was like, but that's, that's like, a, it's a really rare thing, Nick. And like, people shouldn't just be bandying that around. And I'm like, you want to bet? And he just like, I'll buy you a to get his head around it. That that's just how it is. It is in England. So I would say all my oh, under yeah. 18 assessments, there is an undertone, if not an explicit tone, mm. an undertone about the parent. Yeah. Yeah, same. I, I so I recently wrote a paper about um institutionalized parent blame. Um is used as an intervention for the challenging behaviour of parents seeking support for their kids and how it's particularly difficult and basically a trap for autistic people. That wasn't the actual title, but it could have been. Um, and been. I, I was writing the little introduction and like the positionality and why I wanted to write about it. And actually I sat there and I thought, Do you know, in seven years of doing this, mm -hmm. I have never, ever, ever come across any case that doesn't have parent blame. Yeah. None. I feel like they all went to a training that we didn't know about. And like, th that that was it. Like, they were like, do you know what we're going to do now? We're going to do parent blame. It's genuinely... a culture. It, if you think about it though, right, it's psychologically, it makes sense because nobody goes into kind of like social care or teaching or healthcare to essentially screw over disabled kids. They go there because they want to make a difference and they want to be caring. So actually, if we're blaming the parents, that alleviates their, their kind of conscience. So it's like as well that we can frame it within the double empathy problem, because what we're talking about is careers that are dominated by neurotypical people, because that's just sort of who can cope within that environment. And yeah. then they think 
that the parent is the problem because they're not happy with how they communicate. They're not happy with the sort of the sense of social justice. They're not happy with the direct communication. They're not happy with the honesty at the level that we provide it. Um, so then they frame us out, you know, they frame us as the problem rather yeah. than, well, they probably don't even know what the double empathy problem is, but like all I see is the it. problem. And, problem. Yeah. Because when, when I'm put in a position Sunny, it'll be sunny. When I'm putting in a position then where me as an autistic person, but also a professional, has to then educate the professionals, mm. they really can't compute that in their rigid thinking because how can you actually be disabled? Because you're only really disabled if you've got something about you that we can pity or pathologize. Mm. You know, that's when you're properly disabled. And if you're properly disabled, there's no way you can be a professional because you're not competent enough. And then you have to educate them about your child or your experience when they're supposed to be helping you. And that completely throws the perceived power imbalance that we don't subscribe to because we don't subscribe to hierarchy. And that puts you right up the creek without a paddle because then you've got the backs up because you know, we're just saying about the Goldilocks autistic loop. Like, I've, so I've got my kids, my youngest kid's school needs PDA training, right? Mm. Now, bearing in mind, me and Louise work together because I do the autisms and she does the social care, right? Guess who's got to deliver PDA training to my kid's youngest school? Mary. Do you know why? Because I'm just mum. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't this is the thing? Yeah, it's crazy. And but all of this is it, it has, and it, what does does my head in then is the knock on effect of the system and the parent blaming and the no cams and the no services and the no EHCPs and the no doing this. It then results in parent blame when the child's mental health is is on the floor, and the parent's mental health is on the floor. It's then somehow the parent's fault. This is the thing I can I can literally and I think I think it's good that we're being sort of like us, you know, who are very out there. But even that it doesn't help. I know people who have got like doctorates related to autism who've had parent care blame. Mm -hmm. I literally had a social worker tell me that I knew too much. And I'm like, this is literally my job. Like <laughs> too much. And not just your job, but your identity. And that's the thing. And that's the thing. And not just that, right? But if you have a child, even if you're neurotypical, right? If you have a disabled child, whether whatever that is, as a parent, you are going to know everything there is to know, whether you are neurodivergent or not. So for them to be told that you know too much, I think it's just any sort of weaponizing, isn't it? And the knock-on effect on mental health is ridiculous. I mean, there's so many times and the way that that kind of power imbalance with the services as well, because then you've got so, you know, you've got parents that are dragging the children into school when the children are clearly traumatized because they're thinking that teachers know best and they just need to be resilient, but they're terrified of the Senkos because they might get fined. And the effect on the mental health is just... And it's that knock. It's like a pack of cars, isn't it? So you don't send your child into school because you send them into school because you fear the the fallout from not sending them into school because we're told children should be in school. But then we're, we're going, but they're not right. You know, they're really not right. They're not sleeping. There's milk. Da -da 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 -da. There's a list of things going on at home. But you send them in and then you sort of... You know that you're traumatised. Intimidated, intimidated by professionals because they've got the qualifications, they're Senko, they're the head teacher, they're, you know, the social worker, whatever qualification they're, and we, and we can feel intimidated. And then we start gaslighting ourselves going, oh, am I going mad? Is it me? And we're like, oh, yeah. And it just snowballs, doesn't it? It gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And also, there's quite a lot of people out there who need to pass an enhanced DBS, whereas if you've got a criminal record because you're saving your child from a, like an environment that's not suitable for them, 
you're potentially yeah. looking at like ending your career because you've had a criminal activity. Yeah. When yeah, it's not it's not anything of the sort. You are just trying to after yeah, I remember something that went through Facebook about sort of like a husband dragging his wife into work kicking and screaming and crying and how like that wouldn't be acceptable. But we do it to vulnerable young people. Okay, so any advice on where to go? A child has trauma, severe anxiety, physical health needs, autistic can ADHD traits with PDA. Nobody in health school or uh, healthcare or school know how to manage it and being refused assessments at every turn. So I'm assuming that's yeah. So we, okay, so I'm assuming what you do it, what you've done is applied for an EHCP and you've been refused. So. 99% of the time you will have to appeal any EHCP decision. Um, that needs to be bringing together in an education, health and care plan, because that's the point of one, you know, um, to bring all this together so we can look at all the individual needs and what they look at together so that we can work out how that fits holistically. So I would say you need to apply for an EHCP. And if you get turned down for an assessment, you need to appeal. Um, you know, if you're in receipt of certain benefits, like if nobody in the house is working or you're on carer's allowance or you're a carer, um, you will be able to get legal aid to do the appeal. So all you need to do is apply. Um, you'll be able to access quorum. We do some stuff for quorum, don't we? Under legal aid assessments. Um, and that will access your private reports, which unfortunately you will need. But yeah, it is accessible. There are ways to to follow the process and, and the systems, and and sometimes it does come good, but it's not quick. Also, they sort of because obviously they're separate teams in separate sort of parts of trusts. Now here it's called a TAF, which is a team around the family meeting. Some people call it a TAC. Essentially, whatever you want to call it in your local area, it is a multidisciplinary team meeting. And you could absolutely request one of them and attempt to get them all in the same. And you'd be probably more likely to get them all in the same team's room than you are to get them all in the same physical room. But yeah. it, that isn't impossible. And that can go a long way. And putting that into a, a framework where somebody has notes and somebody's passing around notes. If and you have a large medical team, it can actually be really helpful. Absolutely, um, on a grey neck. Stressful, but like helpful, yeah. particularly if you've got like a short term goal that you really want to sort of like focus on and sort yeah. if, yeah. if, if you can like encapsulate it into that 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 can yeah be, can be a process so like I've, I've just seen it looks like what they're asking for is neurodevelopmental assessment refused psychologists refuse okay so the way to get around that is by asking for an ehcp and appeal it you know the 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 assessment threshold is really really low which is has or may have um sen special educational needs that may require an education and healthcare plan. Well, actually, until we've assessed that, we don't even know if it requires an EHCP. So that's a moot point in law. And the other bit um, may or may have said, well, they've got physical disabilities, so they they meet that kind of criteria. Um, so yeah, do it that way because it may not get you what you need, but it will get you a SALT assessment. It will get you an OT assessment. It will get you an educational psychologist. If you need a social worker and you use quorum, it'll probably get you one of us. Um, but, you know, or it'll probably end up in our inbox and go, no, we can't do that. We're too busy. Um, but, yeah, that's how I would go around it. Because at the minute they're just going, yeah, no, not doesn't meet criteria. But what we're trying to do is identify the individual needs. It doesn't matter if you get the autism diagnosis in this context. It's about going, right, okay, these are the needs. These are the provisions needed to meet the needs. And definitely, definitely, when you have to appeal, if you can and you meet the criteria on civil legal advice, um, use legal aid for that as well. Also so, as well, like, she, you could just be undone the captions for one of the SIP scans that are unofficially closed and not taking on yeah. new, new, they're not taking on any new business. And they don't necessarily publicise that. They just do it quite quietly and they shut the books. Some of them do it publicly, but I know yeah. of at least three that have currently not taken any. Mm. 
Yeah. So her issues at the schools. Go on, you read. You read. I'll let you read. Oh, we saw the issues others had with schools and made the decision to protect our son by never applying for a school place and home him from day one, not traumatising him just to access support that doesn't seem to exist anyway. Mm -hmm. Completely valid choice. Privileged choice. Absolutely privileged choice. All the neurodivergent people are in home ed. Oh, yeah, that's where they all are. That's, that's where they are. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> the girls, particularly the girls, all identified, you know, female at birth. But, like, I, I can remember I was, because my home... My eldest is officially home educated, although we do get a budget now. Um, and I remember seeing a post, and you know how you normally sort of put child, autistic, looking for friends to play Minecraft or something like that. This post in this home ed group identified them as neurotypical. Boy, <laughs> neurotypical, wanting to play Minecraft. And I was like, that is because you are the minority in this group. And I bet what you wanted to say is, are you sure? Not sure? <laughs> necessarily, you know, there's an odd one that slips through. <laughs> but like, yeah. Yeah. and you know what? It is a massively privileged thing. But the thing is, I think for a lot of us, we don't know that our kids are going to struggle until the wheels really fall off. We don't know that. Yeah. I didn't know. Um, got two more questions, Ben. Oh two yeah. Two. Yeah, let's do the last two questions then. Let's do two. Because it's getting, yeah, we're already yeah, half an hour over what we agreed. <laughs> okay, come on. So I applied for legal aid with Corum, but they said I wasn't eligible for it despite having two girls who have suffered burnout. Okay, I'm a single parent carer. Surely this can't be right. So, um, yeah, it's really difficult because if you own your own house, quite often you're not eligible. For legal aid and if you've got okay. an amount of savings you're often not eligible for legal aid um single parent carer I've done two parental requests it's taken me since october when earlier can provide assault no suitable for provision so you need to follow about the alternative provision if you go onto local go government ombudsman and look at the um upheld decisions around alternative provision that'll pretty much give you a template for your complaint what you need to do is follow your local authority um, complaints procedure, which is really lengthy and long-winded, until you get to the top tier. So every time they go, okay, we've looked at your complaint, you go, yeah, that's great. What are you going to do about it? They say nothing, and you go, great, escalate it to the next tier, please. Because people think you're putting a complaint, and the LA look at it, and then you go away, and you have to do another one. No, you need to escalate it. There's either two or three levels. And when you've gone to the third stage, you can then go to the ombudsman, and they'll look at it. Um but yes, so if you've asked for an EHCP twice, um, then instead of asking for it twice, just appeal the first decision. You know, Ipsy give really a really thorough pack on how to appeal um, refusal to assess. Um, that's, you know, everything that you need in the refusal to assess is in the pack. Um, rather than trying to, you know, it's not about the assessment. I mean, I'm pretty sure you can prove that the, the children may or have special educational needs and that's the only threshold that you need to hit. So it's not about you, right? You could write war and peace to a local authority and if that's their policy to knock you back, they're going to knock you back anyway. It's not about where you put dotted your I's and cross your T's. Um, it's about that's what they do to make hope that you go away and save money. So just kick it into appeal as soon as you can. Oh, oh, goldfish oh. Oh. Okay, I'm we love this well, infringement of well, private family life. Working with them. LA APO made a referral to social care, safeguarding risk as advised me blocking welfare checks from LA. They haven't seen my daughter, by class, or teaching her. And this is partly because the safeguarding laws have changed in January, hasn't it? And they've interpreted that as come and knock on my door. I had time to jog on. <laughs> Sorry, this really um, rattles me. Um, it, it, it really does rattle me. So when my son was out of school, way, 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 way back ago, um, before COVID, they never did welfare checks. They would ring me with the school and we agreed that if I needed a call from them, they'd call me. But, you know, they're not qualified. 
Who's not qualified to do a welfare it's check? It's Who is, what are they? And I will be going back to the school, whoever's asked them to do the welfare check, whether it's social care or whether it's their head of that school, and I would ask them what qualifications and what they are wanting to see as evidence for a welfare check. I would be absolutely, I would be belligerent and ask YP and nasty, not nasty, but just just specific, well, I can become a social worker. Um, actually, I'd just say, so what qualifies you? What qualifications do you hold to do a welfare check? What does a welfare check consist of? What will you be doing on this welfare check? And who will you be reporting back to on this welfare check? And can I have a copy of it? And what, what grounds, what grounds do you yeah. have to What explain? grounds? On our yeah, what, are we now? what grounds have you got to do the welfare check? What's the purpose of the welfare check? Well, I can't even say it now. Welfare check. What? There was another one there. Purpose, objective, qualifications. What's happening to that information? How often are the welfare checks? <coughs> Just yeah. wrong. And where, wrong. what is your safeguarding concern? Yeah, so what's the safeguarding what concern? What are um, the risks? Safeguarding has said they've got no concerns. So who's, who's saying you need them? Sure yeah, so what makes you more qualified than safeguarding at the local authority? To oh, decide it the rattles people? me. It really rattles me. It Your really policy, rattles me. Yeah. And they'll say it's policy. Well, their policy does not get to break human rights. It doesn't. No. So if they're worried about it, send them back to the local authority because the local authority will have an amazing time with it. And I think part of me would be saying, you want my, you want to come into my home, our family home, that's a safe base for our children and young person. And you want to come in and represent what's actually caused my child a lot of trauma. No, thank you. No, 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 no. They want eyes on a child. I've been threatened by the LA as not letting them see my child, but they never asked. I will say that back to them. My one suggestion or advice or nugget is, and it's not a real like mind-bogglingly complicated one, is if you have a phone call, you ask for it in email. And, and, and that really is anything. I mean, sometimes I would even say, I'm not going to have this phone call. Can you put it all in email? Yeah. because then you've got written evidence <coughs> as well so even in the home ed community like we talk about being doorstep um because nobody does a welfare check for these kids in home ed <coughs> you know um but sometimes some la's do overstep and they do doorstep and that's why the advice in the home ed community is always keep everything in writing and don't take a home visit and don't let them in your house because it can in some situations with some LAs be manipulated and then they start eroding or removing your rights, like a right to a family life or the right to choose where your child's educated and how they're educated. Um, you ever get a doorstep, Nikki? You FaceTime me and I'll tell them to bugger off. I don't think anyone would dare doorstep me in quite no, I don't think you would, actually. You've got to come out with the way to do it, so, you know... <coughs> I keep saying to you, Donna Mary, I'm like, oh, when am I going to get accused of fee? Yeah. Because that'd be a late, it's not a funny thing and it's not something to joke just about. Just a more effort in time. And yeah, I'm obviously not loud enough about it, am you're I? Not, you're not trying hard enough. Oh, okay, very so quickly, very quickly, last one. What is a neuropsychology report? It's been mentioned by some has one. He has an EHCP and he's in specialist school. So a neuropsychology report is a psychologist that specialises in neurology. Basically, isn't it, Nick? Yeah. I mean, it could be, they could be trying to use big words for essentially a cognitive assessment. Yeah. Yeah. It'll be a form of assessment into his psychology. Um, educational psychologist is educational neuropsychology. I would expect that's something to do with neurodevelopmental needs. But I'm just, I'm just like going to state the obvious. Any reports that have been done about your child, you have a right, a legal right, 
because you are PR to have a copy of that. So I go back to the specialist school and say, I'm really interested and I'm just wondering, can I have a copy of that report, please? That would be lovely. Thank you yeah. very much. I so appreciate your help with this matter. And if it's listed in Section K, where all the reports are that are fed into the EHCP, you should have a copy of them as well. Yes. Um, but yeah, a neuropsychology report will be basically be like a neurodevelopmental assessment of some kind, one would think. And I don't know how many people are watching, but I hope everybody's signed up to the Autistic Advocates um, new package thingy with Jiggy. And Nick King, I keep re recommending your Pandas Online course to everybody. Everybody needs to do in Europe. Out the do. Yeah. Your son's done it, hasn't he? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Needs to redo it in some aspects as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Bless. I think I think we should, although we've still got people with, we'll bless them. Um, I do think we should say good night because we've already done half an hour over what we said we were going to do. Excellent. We could do another yeah. one soon, Nick. We could. Yeah, I don't mind. I, I quite like sitting and chatting with your hair. audience. Oh. There's been a Quick question. What's the minimum age for pandas, Nick? Oh, it's a bit of a weird one. We say eight, but... It's um, Eight, eight, depending on a cusp. I reckon some six-year-olds could do it, but not necessarily all of them. But, like, if you've got that six-year-old that can tell you the names of some really weird dinosaurs that, like, nobody knows, and, like, they have that sort of, that interest in, like, words and, like, big That's long my six-year-old. Like yeah. I think if, if they have that sort of, that kind of brain where they can tell you that it's a paleontosaurus because it's got some flippers that child can do it as early as they want. Um, but we, and you, can we do we a call eight? Because I plucked a number. And can oh, you do a, can you devise a course for like sort of 16, 17 year olds up to like 22, 23 year olds? Do you know what, Mary? Genuinely, there is a teenager course sitting in my head, but you were there sat in my head for about nine months to a year. So like, I wouldn't get your hopes up. Um, but there is, I think, I think there is genuinely teenager course sitting in my head. I think I could absolutely talk about some really, really difficult. Oh yeah, things. we get to we get to bring in all the interesting stuff. Yeah, and yeah. about the, all the other diversities in there as well, which is absolutely. Really cool. And I think I think there is there's a huge amount of room to talk about like everything from sex, like self harm to sex to masturbation. Um, well, if anyone's going to buy that, Reality. I'm not sure, but like, I think I, I definitely think there is room for it out there. I definitely think. Oh, I do, definitely. Yeah. All, so all, all people could talk to some teenagers about, you know, how. I've got quite a few. Sort of, an ND teenager. Yeah. 18, 19 year olds who need, need that sort of education. Autonomy and education. Yeah. yeah. And you know what safe relationships look like, and how they can look like lots of different things. And CVE. I mean, we get we get so much kind of like exploitationy type, stuff. yeah, stuff. Pull from push back factors, pull push. It, it's got such a wide scope as well, hasn't it? And I think the the other thing about it is that I would genuinely I would need to organise like lots of people to come in on it. Um, I know. You're on the list. Am um, I on the list? Am I on the list? Can I? Um, on the list? <laughs> but no, I, th I think I think there's genuinely a huge scope to have a sort of a teenager to young people, like yeah. to twenty five. Yeah, yeah. And I really like that. capacity. Gosh, we could come. We could cover capacity. Yeah. What they need to know about the rights at sixteen. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, super. Thank you, ladies. It has been so lovely. All right, man. Catch up. Yeah, let's right. go. Good night, everyone. Is this where we do the awkward wave? Yeah, let's do an awkward wave. Ben presses the button. Ben um, press the button.
Yeah, yeah, yeah.